Then, America was saved. Embraced by the loving arms of our new president, Joe Biden. Biden has brought back kindness and decorum. No, I wish you were in high school. I could take him behind the gym. Biden is a voice of clarity. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was going to put him uh, foot. A voice of reason. He is the smartest man I know. They're going to put you all back in chains. And he's good with numbers. Let me start off with two words. Made in America. 700 billion and a trillion 300 million billion dollars. Under his leadership, the Biden administration has brought us safety. It has brought us economic prosperity. It has empowered the next generation. And now, you have the chance to make sure it continues for another two years. This election day, vote for whoever the Biden administration is asking you to vote for. They know what's best. Together, we will ensure things will continue to go the way they've been going forever and ever. I'm Joe Biden and I approve this, this, uh, wait, wait, who? You know the thing. See guys, the internet is not always horrible. Occasionally it is a fun, funny, irreverent place, a place where memes can spread ideas faster than ideas traveled in past days. It is November 3rd, 2022. I'm Dave Rubin. This is The Rubin Report. We are live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and Blaze TV. If you have not subscribed to our channels, go ahead and do it. It's like, how many times do I have to tell you this? If you do it, I'll just stop saying it. Enough already with this. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we are uh, mostly today focusing on a Ruben Report uh, locals community Q and A. Uh, got a bunch of great questions all over the the map, politically, personally, all over. Uh, so we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, I wanted to start though today uh, with this appearance yesterday. You know, I'm trying to limit the amount of stuff we do with the View. It's a constant internal conflict here. Like you know, on one hand, it's like the ladies of the View are insane. The show is awful. We shouldn't pay much attention to them. And then on the other hand, because there is an influential set of people that do watch the program, it's like we should be exposing this stuff. This is also, of course, how I feel about MSNBC and Joy Reid and a lot of the CNN stuff and everything else. What I would hope is that when we get to the other side of next week, so let's say Tuesday goes pretty well, and you know suddenly the Senate is looking pretty red and New York maybe went red and Michigan and Arizona, and things are really, really turning. My hope is that going forward, we can focus more on those constant positive stories related to freedom and economic prosperity and human flourishing uh, and have to focus a little less on the lunacy. But as long as the lunacy is encroaching, which it still is, of course, and as I said yesterday, it's never going to go away. Even if we defeat it at the ballot box for the most part, it's not going to fully go away. But I think as we start winning more and it feels like we're on the precipice of that, uh, we can kind of shift and, and focus on the new horizon instead of just always dealing with the lunatics. But in any event, uh, Anne Hathaway, actress Anne Hathaway uh, from Devil Wears Prada. She was in Interstellar. Give me one more Anne Hathaway movie. Princess Di Wow, you got very excited on that one, Kyra. You just lit up Princess Diaries. Okay. Do you have one? Do you have one? Les, Les Miserables. No, you have to say that properly. Les Miserables. Les Mis, Les Mis, Les Miserables. <laughs> no guacamole for you. Uh, anyway, Anne Hathaway, the actress, she was on The View yesterday. And of course, what happens when an actress goes on The View? We're going to do abortion and racism and chopping kids' genitals off and everything else. So we're going to hit a little bit of that and then we'll get to the questions. Real quick, guys, let me talk to you about Bullion Max. You know, as inflation surpasses highs not seen in 40 years, don't tell Joe Biden, the value of the dollar is decreasing with every passing day. You're paying more at the pump, the grocery store for cars and housing. Face it, paper money is worth less. Uh, guys, the limited, the timing couldn't be any better for my new sponsor, Bullion Max. Bullion Max is a direct to consumer precious metals retailer who can help you diversify into gold and silver. It's a hedge against inflation. It's also security for your family in times of crisis. And here's why I love Bullion Max. They're owned by veterans in the precious metal space, offer some of the lowest prices on the internet, and they make it so easy to buy directly from their website. 
I want to help get you started, so I worked out a special offer with them just for you. Get Bullion Max's Silver Starter Kit at employee pricing. Just go to bullionmax.com slash Dave. The kit includes five of the most desirable silver products, products to invest in, including a silver American Eagle and a silver Australian Kangaroo. This offer is limited to just one per household, so get yours now. Go to bullionmax.com slash Dave, bullionmax.com slash Dave, and now back to me. All right, actress Anne Hathaway was on The View, sitting with the Harpies yesterday, and you'd think perhaps they could talk about movies or television or the craft of acting. It's a very serious thing. These are very serious people. Uh, but no, mostly abortion. We're in the fight every minute, and you mentioned the Devil Wears Prada turning sweet 16. Yeah. Some 16-year-old's life has been irrevocably changed yeah. because of the current overturning of Roe v. Wade. May I just say one other thing, and just uh, without going into too many details, my own personal experience with abortion, and I don't think we talk about this enough, abortion can be another word for mercy. We don't know. We don't know. It's not a world in which, we know that no two pregnancies are alike, and it mm -hmm. follows that no two lives are alike, that follows that no two conceptions are alike. Yep. Mm -hmm. So how can we have a law? How can we have a, a, a point of view on this that says we must treat everything the same? And where I come at it from is when you allow for choice, you allow for flexibility, which is what we need in order to be human. So that anyway, I just wanted to include right. that, for that part. Especially for that. It's not, it's not set in stone. Just because it's you get pregnant decision. doesn't mean you get to keep that baby. Yeah, it's a health decision. And it, it can be. It's it really can decision. be. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. God, it, it's so incredible. Almost everything she said right there was completely backwards related to what just happened with Roe v. Wade. So we'll do a quick 101 on this. And this is one of those moments where I know I have a bright audience, so it's like, why do I have to explain it? But, you know, we could be getting some new people who don't know the score. Uh, Roe v. Wade did not, the reversal of Roe v. Wade, did not make abortion legal. It uh, did not make abortion illegal. All it did was kick it back to the states, which is exactly how it was before the original decision, I think in 19, what was it, 1972, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's all it did. So the states then can make choices for themselves. So it's so interesting. She wants flexibility and she wants choice. That is actually the outcome of Roe v. Wade being flipped. Now each state is making choices and offering flexibility to their constituents. So here in Florida, right? Very red right-wing DeSantis stand Florida. We have a 15 week ban on abortion and there's still some exceptions after that. 15 weeks, that's three and a half months. Any of you who have been pregnant or know someone who's been pregnant or were birthed from someone who was once pregnant, understand that three and a half weeks, three and a half months is a, is a pretty reasonable compromise. I would argue that that is far more of a compromise than say eight month abortions. That seems rather excessive if you ask me. But the point is that each state, California can have their eight and nine month and post-birth abortions. And if Kentucky wants something more strict, they can do that. You also have the ability to go to different states and do different things. Uh, you can have nonprofits that will allow people and bus people from one state to another to either have an abortion or to not have an abortion. This is what freedom's all about. So everything that she explained, other than she's for abortion, everything she explained was, was completely, completely nonsensical, which is consistent. Uh, no two lives are alike. Well, of course no two lives are alike. So let's give as much choice as possible. Let's not have the federal government say what everyone has to do. Let's leave it to the states. There was a bunch of guys who used to wear these white wigs and they'd wear these funny jackets and tall socks. And they were into this sort of uh, choice thing. It's very, very bizarre. Uh, anyway, uh, let's now shift because it wasn't just The View yesterday uh, spouting general nonsense. Uh, NBC, there's this thing called NBC now. It's a little unclear to me what it is. I guess it's like they're like, they're trying to be like young hip NBC or it's their LGBT. Q plus NBC, something like that. They did a groundbreaking uh, little piece here on how trans people are struggling to vote. Your voters are concerned they might be blocked from casting their ballots. Yeah, that's because a growing number of states are enforcing stricter voter identification laws that disproportionately impact the community. NBC Out reporter Joe Yurkeba joins us now with more on this. Joe, good morning to you. So first of all, how can voter ID laws create obstacles for transgender people? And where do we see some of the strictest voter ID laws? 
Sure. Yeah. So voter ID laws disproportionately impact trans people because trans people are more likely to have IDs without the name uh, that they go by and the gender marker that reflects how they present. And recent research shows that just over 200,000 eligible trans voters in uh, 31 states that both conduct their elections mostly in person and require or request ID at the polls don't have IDs that reflect their gender identities and the names they go by. Um, and, you know, the states that have the strictest voter ID laws are are mostly concentrated in the South and Midwest. So you're, you know, Tennessee, Wisconsin, Kansas. So voters there are. God, they have everybody. It's like there's all the problems over here and they have everybody looking over here constantly. Having an ID that reflects who you actually are is a key part of securing a democracy. Every Western democracy has this. We are basically the only country at this point in the civilized world who for some reason, a certain set of our states have decided you do not need an ID to vote. When I voted last year in the California recall election, I've told you this many times, I tried to show the guy my ID and he kind of freaked out. All they wanted to know was your name and your address. It's very bizarre because I knew at the time my neighbor's name and address, and I suppose I could have gone in the very next day and said, I am him or I am her, and they would have had to let me vote. Um, are these people implying that these trans people that they're very worried about can't get on planes? Cause you need a plane, you need an ID to get on a plane, which is of course the same thing that they're constantly saying about black people. Black people can't get IDs. I can't find one black person who hasn't gotten an ID. As I said yesterday, it's odd that CNN and MSNBC have not run these videos of all of these black people being turned away. Often I've seen black people on planes. Have you guys seen black people on planes? Every, yeah, we've all seen black people on planes. They seem to be figuring it out. It, they, these, it's the soft bigotry of low expectations. These people are just absolutely ridiculous. And if, if you are an adult who transitions, so you're a biological male, let's say you're a 32 year old dude, and now you wish to live as a woman and you transition, whatever that means, and you'd go through whatever procedures and you legally change your name and everything else, you get a new ID. You get a new ID. So these people are just creating problems. It's like the whole house is burning down and they're worried about the dust bunny in the corner. It is just so silly, so, so silly. Guys, there's an election coming and the Blaze wants to help you figure out what's going on. Uh, as you know, it's right around the corner. It's this coming Tuesday and the stakes have never been higher for the midterms. Several races across the country have gotten very interesting in the past couple of weeks. Will the Republicans win a Senate seat in Washington state of all places? I think it's possible. Is Kathy Hochul really in trouble in New York? Yes. Will voters punish Gretchen Whitmer for her COVID lockdown insanity and finally give her the boot? I hope so. There's a lot to cover this election cycle and we've got you covered. Stu Bergier, who kind of serves as Blaze Media's, I can't get this word right, Cephalogist? Cephalologist doesn't sound right to me. Oh God, Cepha, cephalologist. <laughs> it's a fancy word that means someone who studies elections. Wait, cephalologist, cephalologist? That doesn't seem right. We're opening up the comment section to doom today. Uh, well, anyway, Steve put together a, a comprehensive list uh, to let you know exactly what you need to look out for on election night. Head on over to theblaze.com slash election guide to receive a free copy of Blaze Media's ultimate guide to the midterms delivered straight to your inbox. That's blaze, theblaze.com slash election guide. And we will send you everything you need to know to be ready for the big election night. And now back to me. I want to try to read that word one more time. I've got it right in front of me here. So if I have it right, let me, where's the word? Do I have it here? Cephologist. Does that sound right? Cephalogist. That doesn't sound like a real word to me. Anyway, let's move on. We got a Ruben Report Locals Community Q&A for you. Uh, if you want, if you're in the chat right now, you can still submit questions. Maybe we'll do some on the fly. That's rubenreport.locals.com. Chris says, my husband, who also happens to be gay, <laughs> I see what you did there, and I have been married for a year and a half and together for eight We've uh, both been fairly sure we didn't want children, but I'm beginning to have thoughts about wanting to adopt. What changed your mind about fatherhood and what advice would you give a fellow gay couple? Well, look, you know, I've told you guys many times and you can watch my interview uh, from what, about three months ago with Jordan Peterson. We have some clips on this channel and, and the full things on Jordan's channel uh, about how he really, when we were on tour, helped me 
move on children. David had wanted children for a while. David's a little younger than me. I grew up in a time in the 90s, you know, or 80s and 90s where there was no such thing as gay marriage. I never really thought of my future that way. I was putting everything I had into stand up and then what became this career. So I was just distracting myself all the time. And it was just, I was just living my life kind of day to day to day. And I suppose in some ways that led to success, right? Because I put so much into it. But I never thought about that sort of long-term stuff. David, again, because he is a little bit younger, he grew up in a time where he knew he was going to get married one day. It didn't seem crazy to have a family and all that. So he wanted kids and we were married. And then I'm listening to Jordan talking about, you know, how, how most human beings, not everybody, but to live a fully actualized, complete life, that having kids and maybe eventually, if you're lucky enough, becoming a grandparent, it's so fundamentally part of the human story that most people need that to live that complete life. And I was hearing that and I'm hearing it from David and, and then I just kind of moved on it. And I have to say, I'm at, at the ripe old age of 46 years old. I'm, I'm not the youngest parent in the stable, but, uh, but actually my knee's been feeling pretty good lately and, and I'm enjoying it. Uh, I've only posted pictures of the kids in the locals community. I, I'm not gonna be putting it all over YouTube and Instagram and everything else, but I thought we'd just show you this quick 30 second video. This is what we did on, on uh, Halloween just a couple days ago. And uh, I think you'll see why Parenthood's pretty, it's pretty good. All right, first Halloween, we just started trick-or-treating. Here's Justin, the skeleton, very excited. A little on the chunky side for a skeleton, but still pretty good. There's Luke, a little more skeleton-y. And there's Daddy and Dad. Yeah, oh, and Clyde, and Clyde, dressed up as Clyde. There you go, happy Halloween. So yeah, we were out there with all the other families and I got to tell you, even here in Florida, nobody was weird that there were two dads and anything. And think about it, if we didn't have kids and we were just two dudes out there pushing strollers with no kids in them, that would have been weird. That was funny, guys. Thank you, Connor. Getting nothing out of these two. That was funny. You know what I mean? Just two dudes pushing strollers. Well, I guess it's Halloween. It would have been, there would have been something there. Um, anyway, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a joy so far. I, I would say that if your husband is on the fence, you, you just got to keep talking about it. You got to talk it through. He, maybe he won't get to the other side. Um, but you got to talk about it. It's like, what is, what is the point of being in a long-term monogamous? If you're in a monogamous, monogamous relationship, like what is really the point? And I think the point is to build something that's everlasting that you can then hand to the next generation and the next generation will hand it to the next generation. And that is a little more complex when the biology doesn't fully match up. And there are, there are other issues related to that. This is exactly what I got into with Jordan Peterson. Um, it's not just as easy as saying, okay, let's, let's just create a family just like that and see how it goes. Like you're changing the paradigm a little bit. You're changing what the traditional structure looks like. You're, you're a little outside of that. It doesn't mean it can't be as good. It doesn't mean it can't be better. It doesn't mean that the traditional structure is always great, right? Plenty of people are born into all sorts of dysfunctional families, but you really gotta, you really, really gotta think about it. Uh, Shmoo says, what kind of shenanigans do you think the lefty Dems and establishment Dems and rhinos will be up to for this midterm election next week. Same old, same old, or something new and special. Well, I don't know if uh, you saw it last night. I think we're gonna show some clips of it tomorrow. Joe Biden gave a, a really crazy speech last night, uh, warning people of the threats to democracy and that the elections, some elections might take a few days to figure out who the winners are. And this has been a trend that we've been seeing more and more and more, where people don't concede on election night, things get dragged out further. It's like, this is why you need secure elections. This is why you need voter ID because we need to know that night. We need to know that night. It's almost, it, it basically is as simple as that. You cannot prolong these things and give more credence to the idea that there's shenanigans, have people dropping things off in the middle of the night and then cameras go out. It's all the weird stuff that everybody, regardless of your political alignment, we're all kind of seeing and feeling. And this idea that, that both sides suddenly are just never going to agree uh, on who won or lost is a huge problem. Look, this year, by every estimation, the Republicans are going to crush it. There is no momentum behind the Democrats, right? Even like who's really a Biden supporter right now? Who really is out there at a rally excited for Biden? Who's out there excited for Charlie Crist? Who's out there excited for Kathy Hochul? Who's out there excited for more government control and more mandates? Now I get it, a certain set of people, let's say 30% of the electorate is always going to vote blue Democrat no matter what. Maybe it's more than that, maybe it's 
And then you have this other marginal 10% that can push them over or, or crush them. So there's a certain amount of NPCs and people that are just, you know, completely just duped by the system. But this year, it's like there is momentum what is happening in New York. The, the thing that, that started here in Florida has now been exported. And I'm telling you guys, if we can just get through Tuesday and Tuesday is good, look, will they, to directly answer your question, will they likely start violence in the streets again if they feel like they're losing power and they need to just like distract the machine or the machine needs to distract the people? Yeah, they'll start some violence in the streets again. Will they claim, I mean, suddenly it will go that you, were, you weren't allowed to question elections for four years and then suddenly they'll all be saying it, right? What's, what is Stacey Abrams, who already denied an election last time, what's she doing right now? We played you the clip a couple of days ago. CNN is reporting record early voting turnout at the same time as she's saying there is going to be fraud. There's no evidence of it. Again, just, you have to just, what do you see in front of your eyes? Where is the video of all of the black people being turned around? Where is any evidence that anyone that wants to vote cannot vote? They keep saying it. Hillary says she literally, she said she literally has evidence that the MAGA Republicans are gonna steal the election. Well, okay, lady, how about you literally show it to me? How about that? <laughs> Caesar says, what's your latest dad joke you've dropped on the people? Oh my God, well, you guys are bludgeoned with these things all day. I mean, my main dad joke is, you know, there's a lot of poop and pee around here and now we have kids. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, what else? That's really my main one. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm dropping that one two, four, seven times a day. It, it, it can be quite... Yeah, Daphne's like ready to vomit right now. It's, uh, it's pretty bad. Uh, Delaney says, Dave, how conflicted are you with the possible 2024 presidential candidates? Well, look, if you're, if you're really asking, you know, about the Trump DeSantis situation, first off, let me say one more time. I've said it many times. I have no idea whether Ron DeSantis wants to run for president. I know the guy freaking loves Florida. I know that he is doing a bang up job here. I cannot imagine anyone being a better chief executive of the state. If you think about how quickly the reconstruction of Southwest Florida has gone after Hurricane Ian, I mean, just everything here has been run so well. The apparatus of the state is tight. It's, it's exporting into the cities, guys like Francis Suarez, uh, mayor of Miami, who I had on a couple of weeks ago. It's like, there is such a culture of freedom here and I'm meeting all sorts of people, all sorts of people who get it. Uh, not only is it, is it the new people who are here, but there were sort of like, you know, half kind of Democrats, half Republicans, or a lot of the people who came from New York even years ago before COVID who come down here and then they kind of vote the, right, the wrong way. They're waking up to it. So it's like, there, there's some goodness here, but I don't know, well, there's a ton of goodness here, but I don't know what DeSantis wants to do. Would he make an excellent president? Obviously. And if there is a uh, massive red wave, as I just said, it will, it will be because it started here in Florida, right? You guys saw that ad we showed you at the, show, at the end of the show yesterday. It's like, well, that's the thing that we want to export to America. We want to, we want to export Floridian Americanism to America, if that makes sense. And I think we're doing it. But so if there is that w red wave, and it feels like, boy, the culture is shifting and the, po the politics of all this are shifting and we've sort of defeated the woke at the ballot box in many ways and culturally. Like people have had it with the eight month abortions. They've had it with chopping kids' genitals off. They've just had it, right? Then it's like if DeSantis could then come in and just be like, hey, I'm the president for everybody. I'm gonna do this in more of a Reagan style way. There's going to be an aspirational meaning to my presidency and I'm gonna be competent in all of those things. Look, will the media still try to destroy him? Of course. Of course, of course, as I keep saying, he'll, he'll be, they'll say he's Trump, but he's competent. So he's double Hitler, right? But there's a real argument that, that at that point, once the culture has shifted, once the politics game has shifted, that he's the most functional guy to go forward. I think you can make a good argument for Trump too. The good argument for Trump is he came in once, he shook this thing up more than anybody and he could do it again. And this time, hopefully he would have learned from his mistakes. I think the, the, counter to that in terms of just like the pure numbers of elections is how many new people could Trump bring in? There would be a certain amount of disaffected Democrats, a certain amount of people that are just like Biden's awful, the Democrats are awful, I guess I'll vote for Trump. But there's also by Trump running, you basically get a certain amount of people who would not vote to vote just because they hate him. So it's a little more complex. I just think that's the reality. That being said, I like them both. I think if, I think they should do it on the DL, whatever that arrangement needs to be. But if they have to do it on stage and battle it out, it's like, that's okay. That's what politics is all about. 
Uh, Galersh says, which would be easier, opening a one-time, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> opening a time portal a la Avengers Endgame to travel back in time to keep the second Star Wars series of movies from being made or getting the federal government to spend less than it takes in just for kicks to see what it feels like. Well, first off, I think by the second set of movies, I actually think you might mean the third set of movies if you know my feelings on this, because the second set of movies, the prequels, as I've been saying for years, they're actually pretty good and they're looking better over time. If you're talking about these last three movies, which were horrible and ruined Star Wars and all of that stuff, then I'm with you. Which would, was the question, which would be more difficult? Which would be more difficult to do, right? Or which would I rather do? Wait, I gotta, I wanna get this right. Which would be easier? I mean, getting the federal government to spend less money, it's impossible. I think it would be more worthy of getting out there, finding some plutonium from Libyans, building a flux capacitor and getting into a time machine and doing that. Because the federal government is never going to get, it's never going to tighten its belt. It's just not how it works. Next up, what do we have here? Elizabeth says, uh, besides the freedom, what's your favorite part of living in Florida. Let me try to come up with a different one. Cause okay, there's the spirit of freedom. And then I always say, it's like the people, their people are just great. Everyone is just great here. People are happy and functional and decent and warm and nice. And you know, down here in Miami area, it's like, there's so many cultures here and, and it's diversity, not just because it matters that this guy happens to be uh, Cuban and this guy's white and this guy's whatever, but it's like, just like all this different food and like, it's all good. What else is great? I mean, this is, this is obvious. The weather, like right now, first off, the summer wasn't bad. It really wasn't bad. My hair was a little lower. Now it's the fall, so it's getting higher again because uh, of the humidity. Um, but the weather is great. Um, you know what? The lizards. I like the lizards. I've become a reptile guy. You know, there was always one kid in high school that had reptiles and you were like, you got to stay away from that kid. Nobody want, you had, you know, because they were always up to something else. Probably not so great. I like reptiles, okay? I like iguanas. I like frogs. I like lizards. I don't care what you think. There, there you go. Rebecca says, can the Republicans stand up and ask the Dems to pledge that they will accept the results of this election? We will win and they will try to overturn it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting and you're getting to something from the, the previous question. Look, look what happened right here in Florida during the, the Republican Senate debate. Uh, there's a woman by the name of Val Demings. I think she was a uh, police chief in Orlando before this, if I'm not mistaken. She's running as the Democrat and she's running against Marco Rubio. Now there's every reason to believe that Rubio will win. He's generally liked here. The state's obviously going very red. He's associated with DeSantis. So it's, it's all looking good for, for Marco Rubio. Uh, but again, it's an election. You just never know what's gonna happen. At the debate, which was about a week and a half ago, the, the moderator asked the two of them, will you accept the results? And Rubio said, yes, we have secure elections here. He said, yeah, I'm gonna win, but yeah, we have secure elections here. Of course, I'm gonna respect it. Demings would not quite say that. Hillary Clinton running around saying she has evidence that they're planning to steal an election, except she won't show you the evidence. Stacey Abrams, the four years that all of these people pretended that Russia installed President Trump and there were 42 CIA, uh, FBI, CIA agents who had all signed on to say that something weird happened and a fake impeachment over the whole freaking thing. It's, it's gonna be tough. But again, this is why at the very least, you would want voter ID. You would want a actual uh, signature match, right? We'd want some cameras in some of these places. You'd want less uh, mail-in ballots, but they want more mail-in ballots. It's like, you just gotta see it, man. You just gotta see it. Sweetwater says, did you have a hard time finding a home you both liked when you moved to Florida? So, you know, we moved, it's just under a year ago. We got to Florida on December 17th, 2021, a day I will never forget. As I've said to you guys, that moment when we were in the plane and the plane landed and I was lucky enough, we had, we had friends who hooked us up and so we, we were able to fly private because I really didn't want to put Clyde under the plane, you know, because every now and again, you hear these horror stories of dogs that are under the plane and the pressurized cabins and all, all sorts of bad stuff. So we had friends that, that really helped us out. Uh, so I was sitting in the cockpit of the plane when it landed and we're, we're getting to the landing strip. And I'm telling you that the wheels hit the ground. I felt something lift off my chest. I wanted to get out so badly. I, we were so excited to be here. So we moved, uh, got here December 17th. We, we found this house, it was Halloween weekend. Uh, so it was literally a year ago right now. 
Um, and we saw about 20 places. Um, you know, the, the key thing is we wanted a house that would be functional to have my team working here. So we needed some, a certain amount of space and we needed uh, something. This, this room that we're doing this in, that's our studio now, actually was a movie theater. Uh, the guy who owned the house previously, it was, a, it was a bedroom that he converted to a movie theater. So it was fully soundproofed. It worked for the lighting and all that stuff. That's why this all looks pretty good and we didn't have to do a tremendous amount of work to, to, uh, to expand on that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we saw about 20 places. This was the only house that we both, we walked into this house and we were like, this is the house. Th this is the house. Also they had in the house, we're not using it right now because of the kids, but they have this, uh, this scent stuff. What's that brand? Do you know what the brand is that has the scents that run through the house? You know, like when you go to a hotel or you go to a casino and you walk in and the air just has a certain scent to it. There's, oh, I think it's called Aroma 360 is the company that does it. But we walk in this house and they just had this lovely scent going throughout the house. So you can get different essential oils and put it in there. But we walked in, it's a beautiful house. Also, it was nice because uh, the house is kind of a V. So the, the portion of the V that we're in right now is sort of our work portion. Although my bedroom is right downstairs, the master bedroom, but it's a, we got all the work stuff going on over here, all the life stuff going on over here. So it worked out nicely. And we have kind of similar taste and everything. So it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't that big of a lift. And there was a basketball court. So I was pretty much willing to buy it uh, sight unseen. Uh, Roman says, did you find it amazing at how many celebrities don't appear to have $8 a month to pay for Twitter verification? So if you have not seen this, uh, as I always say, if you are not on Twitter, don't get on Twitter. But the big brouhaha over the last couple of days is that Elon Musk originally said that he was going to charge people $20 a month for the blue verification. That's just a little blue check next to your name. Uh, and he said that he wanted to charge people for it because it would be a way of generating revenue that then they could perhaps give to creators. Also, he's trying to get the company to be profitable. You know, that's what you do when you buy a company. Anyway, he got a little pushback on that. Then it, they somehow came up with $8 a month. That, so for $8 a month, you could get a little blue check and that you might get some bonus uh, features along with that. Like your notifications might be organized a little bit differently. You might show up in search a little bit more. Listen, I think there's all sorts of reasons that a sort of pay to play thing is not necessarily the best idea, especially when it comes to search and all that. That being said, I also think there's huge amounts of benefits to having a certain level of pay for play, which is exactly why we did locals the way we did. The fact that I only take questions right now from people who put in a couple dollars a month. It, it, it makes things more mature. It makes everyone's behavior better. When you have a little skin in it, you, you act a little bit differently. We don't allow for a million burner accounts. So anyway, I think, I think having some level of subscription, some level of ads, like you can figure out how to mix these things all together. And that's what a mature internet maybe on the other side of all this craziness will look like. Uh, but yes, there was a huge amount of celebrities and, and journalists, et cetera, that were basically like, I'm never gonna pay Elon Musk $8 for blah, blah, blah. It's like, man, you pay eight bucks at Starbucks for a venti cappuccini macchiati uh, thing with the ice there and the half the thing's ice anyway. So yes, these people just, it's like, Look, I would say one thing about the verification thing. Verification originally was set up not as a moneymaker, but just to prove that you were who you were, right? Because there are, there are people who impersonate me, steal my picture, pretend that they're me. They spell my name one letter off and then they confuse people. So the verification was just really so that, oh, if you saw Dave Rubin at Rubin Report, you knew it was the Dave Rubin. Um, so the idea that you would start selling this so anyone could be verified it changes a little bit of what verification is. Uh, and once everyone is sort of verified, then is anyone verified? That being said, he said that the other piece of this was that he wanted to get rid of bots and spam accounts. And it's like, bots are not gonna pay $8 a month to be bots or whoever is sending those bots, right? That's not gonna work for them. So yeah, these are all the things he has to work out. But watching people go crazy, $8 a month, I'm not gonna... All right, come on. Uh, Lynn says, where are you having Thanksgiving dinner and what's on the menu? So Thanksgiving is the one major holiday that we host with David's family and his mom and, and grandma and sister and brother and sister-in-law and all sorts of people come. Do we have some pictures of some of the food? We, uh, we, I am very fortunate to, uh, that is last year's turkey, which, oh, mama mia, just perfect. We got some fresh cranberry sauce right there on its way to cranberry sauce. Looks like uh, some sweet potatoes over there. What else do we got? Anything else? Anything else? And some uh, butternut squash soup with a little chipotle pepper in there. 
uh, just absolutely perfect. Uh, so yeah, we do host that uh, Thanksgiving here. Uh, this will be our first Thanksgiving in Florida, obviously. Uh, no, yeah, no, it will be our first Thanksgiving in Florida and uh, we are very thankful for Florida. So uh, it should be a good one. And uh, yeah, I, I just love Thanksgiving. Like just having one day where it's a holiday that's, it's a purely secular American holiday. It's a celebration of America, nothing else. Just, hey, it's pretty freaking good here. Be thankful for it. One of the things that I always think is interesting about Thanksgiving is when you see the reaction online of certain people, uh, because the, the lefties, unfortunately, and the wokesters, they're always attacking Thanksgiving now, right? They're, and that they're not thankful for anything. And I think a little, a little thankfulness, a little humility, a little understanding of why you should be so freaking thankful to live in this country, uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, Talway says, now that you're a dad, who, uh, do you think the, do you, do you think you view the world, the culture wars and the political world any differently than you did before you're a dad? Well, not differently, but I think it's, it's kind of renewed or doubled down. Like I really got to make sure that the world is in good shape uh, when I'm gone. Right, because now I have kids that I, it is my responsibility and my duty to make sure that they live in the best world possible. Um, you know, another part of just sort of, this isn't exactly to what your question was, but I, I think I said something like this a couple of weeks ago. Another part of this whole experience and journey that we're just at the beginning of that's been really nice is so much of my life is about me, right? Like I do this show, people, I go places, people say hi to me, I am invited places so that I can speak. It's a lot of, it's a lot of me. And that's great in one way and very rewarding and validating that I've done something, I guess, pretty decent here and that what I'm saying and what I care about actually matters. That's actually really wonderful. Um, but it all, it can be a little maddening too, right? I think that's why so many celebrities go nuts. It's why comedians go crazy. It's why, you know, uh, public people do drugs and like lose their shit. Like, I think there's some connection there between like the endless ego part of it. So, you know, just laying there this morning, again, this morning, I'm up at 7.15, I'm take, I take the kids for the first hour and it's just me. Luke was pretty much out this morning, but Justin is up. He's, you know, he's rolling into month three now and he's, he's not talking, but he's making a lot of sounds now. He's trying to talk like there's something going on there and he's smiling at me and I tell him a little bit. I was, at the same time, I was emailing with Phoenix going back and forth on how we're going to do the show and I, I just kind of read it to Justin. I said, what do you think about this? What do you, what do you think? We're going to do this Joe Biden thing, you think? Uh, and it's like, it's been good. It's been good. Uh, Kate says, will you be doing any live streaming on election night? Well, I guess we can tell people our election plans. Uh, so on election night, uh, so on election day, which is next Tuesday, I'll be doing a show here. And then we are hopping in a car and we are going cross state up north to uh, Northwest Florida, which is where Tampa is. And that is where uh, the DeSantis campaign will be having their obvious uh, victory event, victory party that night. Uh, so I and Lisa Booth from Fox News, you guys know Lisa Booth, we are co-hosting the DeSantis victory party. So that's gonna be awesome. We'll be on and off stage all night. We'll be announcing results as they come in. Uh, it's just, just gonna be a fun celebration of freedom and America and all that. And I will also do a show from there. So a little bit of that we have to do on the fly, but we will do a show at some point throughout the evening. Uh, hopefully I can get Governor DeSantis to join me. And you know, there's obviously campaign surrogates and some of my, my Florida crew that you guys know will be there. So we're gonna do it a bit on the fly. So I don't know exactly what time it is because I'm also gonna have to jump off and, and be on stage and do the show and all that. And then we're also gonna try to uh, simulcast some of that with the guys at The Blaze, uh, Glenn and, and the whole crew over there who I love. They wanted me to go to Dallas for election night, which I thought would be great. And we could do five hours of coverage together. It'd be, it would be fun and awesome. Uh, but obviously once I got the, the invite from the governor, um, I was gonna do that. So yes, party that night, uh, live stream, and uh, just bear with us, we'll figure it out. But it, it is definitely gonna be a celebration of freedom that night. Uh, Lloyd says, as we tape the last of our seeming 17,000 boxes for our escape from crazy Cali to Idaho, congratulations. My wife says we have a lot of stuff. Not stuff, but a lifetime of memories. When you moved, did you downsize it all? Has it all fit into the new studio, house and studio? Um, well, first off, congratulations on getting out. And I'm sure you're gonna love it in Idaho and it's good to get out of Cali. Cali, 
Cali is the most sort of banged up state that we've got. They have made their choice with Gavin Newsom. Like he's about to be reelected again. There's just no doubt about it. It's, it's a far gone conclusion. New York has a chance. Actually polls the last two days are showing Lee Zeldin in the lead. And as I keep saying about Hochul, Nobody voted for her. She was installed, so she loses a little bit of that incumbents. You know, incumbents usually win because people are sort of mindless when they go in and they just click things. Oh, I recognize that name. But nobody's ever clicked Kathy Hochul before. Nobody's ever ticked that, swiped it, you know, checked it, whatever you want to say. Uh, so I think Zeldin really has a chance. So congratulations, first off, on leaving California. It's wonderful. You're going to live in a new place with new people and you're going to flourish and thrive. There's just no doubt about it. And, and I can tell you that because... Not only has that worked for me and everybody that's in that the studio with me right now that we've we've all built better lives once we left, uh, but then you start meeting other people that left, and when you when you're suddenly around some people who leave for a reason, you find common cause in sustaining the thing that you came to, and that is a beautiful thing. That is a really really beautiful thing. I think it's one of the reasons that Florida is going so red because people are like, yes, I am going to save this freaking thing because you guys saved me. Um, so the question was about memories and, and all the stuff that we had. You know, we gave away a whole bunch of stuff. Actually, I gave away, uh, we had a whole bunch of outdoor furniture that we had just got in Cali, but I couldn't move everything. We had two trucks going and it was just starting to get nuts. So I gave uh, a whole bunch of our outdoor furniture to uh, Patricia Heaton. You may remember Patricia Heaton as uh, the wife and everybody loves Raymond. Uh, her and her husband, Dave, became good friends of ours and they were having, we had a final dinner in uh, Los Angeles, I think two nights before we left with uh, Dennis Prager and his wife, Sue, and uh, Larry Elder and his girlfriend and, uh, and Dave and Patricia came by and I was like, hey, you guys want some stuff? So we just started giving some stuff away. Um, but uh, yeah, we gave, I gave some clothes away and stuff like that. Fortunately, we, we've got some, it's a pretty decent sized house here. We've got some storage, so we're still not unpacked. One day we'll get unpacked, I suppose, right before we move again. Uh, Jeb says, Dave, you keep asking everyone what their election predictions are, but what are your election predictions? Uh, you know, I wrote out a map that they're going to debut on election night for the blaze. Um, but look, I really think Zeldin is going to win in New York. That's the, that's the one that I think is the big one, okay? Um, obviously, Florida will remain red. I think Oz has got to win Pennsylvania. It, it, it is almost beyond imagination that Fetterman could win, okay? So I think Oz will win there. I do think Blake Masters is gonna win in Arizona as well as Carrie Lake. Like, I really think the Senate, it, it could be end up 54 Republicans. I know that's bullish. And, you know, I know we're all in our own little bubbles and all that stuff, but I, I just think people have had it with the woke. There are no rallies for Democrats. Everyone knows, even the most ardent Biden supporter, knows that something is not right with Joe Biden. Like th there's no momentum there. They're prepping us for no momentum. And the ideas were bad. All they had to do was not be horrible. Uh, what, what are you showing me here? Real Clear Politics is now predicting that New Hampshire will even get a Republican Senator. So th there is real, real momentum here. And, and again, I just think, you know, it's funny. While the meme out there, if you listen to mainstream media, will be if the Republicans take over, we'll have fascism and homophobia and bigotry and all of these things. It's like, how about we just end up like Florida is? What if Florida just exported Americanism, right? And what if people just started living their lives more the way they wished? You know, like I don't see any bigotry down here. It's odd. I certainly don't see fascism. I see a government that kind of gets out of your way. And then you know what happens when a uh, massive, basically category five storm crushes part of the state? Within two, three weeks, almost all the infrastructure is rebuilt. That we do everything we can. The government, when necessary, comes in and does the right thing. That's what we can get back to. And uh, I think if we export that, if we export that, the, the woke thing, it could, it could go away pretty quickly. As I said, it's not gonna fully go away. And there'll always be a set of, of anti-American hysterical lunatics. But if a couple of the states flip and the Senate goes back and we stop spending money like crazy people, and we honestly start having some of these debates again, and we get leaders in who are functional and decent, we could really get back to the dream of the 90s. 
You really could. It was the dream of the 1890s and the 1990s, actually. Uh, guys, stick around for the cold close. As always, if you want to uh, play along during our Q&As and live chat during any of the shows, you can join us at rubenreport.locals.com. We've got a panel for you tomorrow. It's our final panel before uh, the big election. Uh, Michael Malice. We haven't had Malice on in a while. I'm psyched for that. Uh, lawyer Ron Coleman. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, you know, the, the government and Twitter and big tech coordinating to clamp down on your free speech. What is your ability to, to get penalties from them, get money from them, sue the government, et cetera. And then Viva Fry, who also, uh, is a lawyer, former Canadian, now proud Floridian. So it'll be Malice Coleman and Fry, uh, tomorrow. And, uh, and Viva was just suspended on Twitter this week post Elon. So we're going to have to talk about that. He had a theory about Nancy Pelosi that I guess the powers that be didn't really like. And we leave you as we brought you in with the elderly man pretending to be president. See you tomorrow. I just have one thing to say. Hang on here. <laughs> All right. There you go. Dance a little bit, Joe. Come on. I tell, you, my man. <laughs> I tell you what, if I had the talent of any one of these people, I'd be I'd be elected president by acclamation. <laughs>